Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis, and in this video I'm going to talk about two different topics. The first is how to keep your family and yourself warm during a lot of these cold snaps that we're seeing happening all over the planet, uh, particularly down in the southern United States. The grid power has gone down, a lot of people are having trouble keeping themselves warm. We're going to talk about some techniques that you can use to keep yourself, keep your family warm during this. The second topic we're going to talk about is how to try to protect your home. Uh, a lot of houses are not prepared for this kind of cold, especially if the grid goes down, and a lot of damage can result thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of damage. We're going to talk about maybe not necessarily how to completely prevent all that, but how to really mitigate a lot of the damage that is going to be coming to people if they don't take a couple of steps of prevention. But before that, I wanted to talk about another thing related to prevention, and that is the idea that what's happening right now is a real teachable moment. I know a lot of times people say that uh, talking about something being a teachable moment while people are in the middle of it is kind of crass, it's sort of heartless, you should just be telling people, oh, it's okay, there's nothing you possibly could have done to have created the situation for yourself, just feel better. Uh, but I think that's a real mistake and it sets people up to keep repeating and repeating and repeating these things on into the future. The good news is, is that we created this situation for you guys. We all did it collectively. This is something that we have uh, work towards to uh, generate both by the way that we set up our power grid and certainly the uh, crazy weather patterns are something that are very arguably are being set up by human activity as well. There are so many things that you and I and other people have done to create this situation and that's kind of a good thing because uh, the easiest problems to solve are the ones that you yourself created because it's completely completely within your power to change your behaviors and then have those problems go in the way in the future. Now we're not going to get into all the nitty-gritty of all the different things that we could do to uh, prevent this type of thing in the future. Uh, you know, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, different things that you could do in terms of, you know, your house and the way your home is set up to try to make it so that things are better in the future for you. For example, the house that I'm in right now, I've got a wood stove, so even if the grid goes down, I can keep the house completely toasty warm. In fact, my back is getting a little bit warm right now. And even if we didn't want to burn firewood, if we just wanted to walk away from our house all winter, because we have so much insulation on the house, that's not a problem. Nothing's going to freeze in this house because it's burned into the ground. It has a lot of geothermal energy. All that insulation around it uh, prevents it from going down below freezing. And while I know insulation is a dirty word, it's like, oh, that's what people who care about the environment want insulation and everyone else is like, ah, I could deal without that. It's a pretty nice feeling to know that I could just leave my house all winter and I don't have to worry about it in the same way that a lot of people are having to worry about their, their homes, their pipes freezing and all that right now. So we're going to talk a little bit about that kind of stuff as well. Uh, but first, let's talk about how to keep yourself and your family uh, safe and warm because it you have family members freezing to death. It, uh, I don't mean to laugh about that, but if you have family members freezing to death, whether or not your house has damage is going to not seem like that big of a deal. So let's keep you guys alive first. Now, I did a video uh, just the other day about how to dress in layers. I live in New England. We are all used to having really uncomfortable uh, weather for about half the year. It's, you know, it's cold, it's wet, it's damp, it's windy, it's uncomfortable, and we know all about how to stay warm during that. And in this video, I show you how to do it with summer clothes. So here's a link if you want to check that video out. Completely all summer clothes, how you can stay 100% nice and toasty warm all winter long, even outside, just wearing summer clothes. So click on that link if you want to check that out. But let's talk about how to stay warm inside because you're not going to be staying outside all the time and there are a lot of things that you can do to uh, augment uh, the way that you can uh, keep yourself warm uh, if you're inside the house. It's good to stay inside the house because you're sheltered from the wind, you're sheltered from the weather and everything. Uh, but a lot of people's houses are cold and your heating systems may not be working. So how can you get some heat into your house? Now some people are doing crazy things, like trying to build fires in their house. This is a safe way to build a fire in your house. You don't just put a trash can in your house and light a fire in it and expect that to go well. You can, however, build a fire outside. Now. Uh, you know, I'm just going to just blanket this out right now. Right now, If you don't know how to deal with fire, don't do any of this stuff. Fire is dangerous. It can kill people. It can cause all sorts of problems. But if you know how to build a fire outside, you can take a lot of that heat back with you into your house. One great way to do it is by heating up some kind of a thermal mass. Now, my house heats up a thermal mass in the form of this uh, giant rock floor. There's a, a big uh, stone slab under the house. We take the hot air from uh, the wood stove that goes all the way up blow it under the floors, and the floor right now is toasty warm. It's really comfortable to walk on. But there are all different types of thermal masses, and one great one is liquid water. Uh, a lot of people have access to liquid water. You, 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 
if you don't have it coming out of your tap right now, you can get snow, you can melt water, and if you can uh, boil water outside on a pot, you can take that water and put it into like, a, you know, any kind of a container, like a juice jug. Now this is a juice jug, this used to have uh, orange juice in it. Uh, you can see I poured some hot water into this the other day to use it as kind of like a hot water bottle, and it completely deformed the jug. The jug did not used to look like this, all crazy like that. If you use a juice bottle uh, as a way of uh, putting some hot water in, especially if it's close to a uh, boiling point, expect the juice bottle jug to kind of get a little bit wonky. If you're pouring water into the top, it's a good idea uh, to put a funnel in so you don't distort the, uh, the top area, because if you pour hot boiling water up on the top with the screws, the screws could uh, distort, and then you could get a leak up there. That said, you don't ever want to really trust these anyway. If you're going to be, you know, hugging one of these to try to keep you warm inside of your house, you want to keep it upright because, uh, you know, if you have it on the side, I... I have personal experience with this. I was in a travel trailer once trying to survive a couple of winters. Our heating system went down. I was heating up water, uh, bring it to uh, bed with me in jugs, putting them next to me, uh, really tightly sealed on their side, and they always still manage to leak. Uh, you know, if only just because the temperatures are changing, pressure is changing as the, uh, you know, the temperature changes inside the jug, uh, it invariably gets you wet, and if you're wet, you're not going to stay warm very long. So uh, these are great if, as long as you can kind of keep them vertical. Another way of uh, bringing the warm in is these classic hot water bottles. Now, this is something you either own or you don't own. If you do happen to own any of these, I again would suggest if you're pouring hot water into the top of them, use a funnel because one of the, I'm going to use the word stupid, uh, design uh, elements of these is that, uh, in fact, it says it right on top. Uh, yeah, it says uh, don't, it essentially says don't put particularly hot water <laughs> in this hot water bottle right on the top. It says uh, below 120 degrees. That's not particularly hot. Most of this hot water bottle can handle really hot water. They have that warning on there. It's like when you buy a coffee and it says like, warning, it's hot. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's for those kind of people that need a warning like that. This is telling you essentially don't put hot water in here. We're not liable if you use this hot water bottle for hot water. Uh, but the only part of these that tend to actually fail with hot water is the screw cap. Now the old style of these, it was rubber all the way around and uh, you could pour whatever kind of hot water you wanted into them. These modern ones, they have this uh, plastic kind of housing in there with the, the screw threads. These crack. They, they crack and they make it so you can't uh, seal them up anymore. It's a real problem. So if you want to use one of these and you're going to pour hot water into them, use a funnel to bypass the plastic at the top, get, stick the funnel down into it, fill up the bottom, then screw uh, the top on and you should be okay. I've had experience with that where you can put nice hot water in these and uh, you know it's not going to crack the top as long as you go past it with a funnel. Again, you know, uh, you got to be careful. It's hot boiling water and that's a dangerous thing, but we're talking about avoiding death and sometimes you have to kind of, you know, balance your risk. Do I want to have the chance of freezing to death or do I want to, you know, uh, you know, chance the idea that I might scald myself. So be careful whatever you do. Uh, these are okay, but the best thing in the world, and it's probably too late to get these at this point, but this is again, we're talking into the future. If something like this happens again, this is a really nice thing to have. This is a uh, water bladder. Uh, this is made by MSR. Actually, I'll put a link to this down in the description below if you're interested in these. Uh, I take these camping with me all the time, uh, not uh, for a drinking bottle, though they're made for, you know, drinking out of it. They've got like a little, you know, drink spout here. You can, you know, take a, a drink out of these bladders. Uh, what I bought these for is that these can handle hot boiling water, and I will fill these with hot boiling water. They don't leak. You clamp that down the top. They, they're not going to leak on you, and I'll take these and I'll put them into a sleeping bag. If you're at your home, they can go into your bed with you. I would recommend if you do fill this with hot water, you want to take a, a towel or a coat and wrap it around because the outside surface is going to be hot, like hot boiling water. There's no insulation on these. It's just like kind of like a nylon uh, material. Uh, I don't know if it's technically nylon. It's some kind of a, like a, a woven plastic texture textile. Um, but these can hold a lot of water, a lot of thermal mass, and these are going to keep you warm if they're bundled up with you really all night long. And one of the great ways of um, heating these up is by just putting them, filling it up with water, putting it into uh, you know, a pot. You can put a couple of them in there. Uh, you don't want to just put them in dry like that. Fill them up with water and then add water to the whole thing so that it's, you know, it's all water all around. And then you just put that directly over a fire. Now, if you just took these filled with water and put them in here, you'd have this plastic surface right up against the metal surface, right up against the flame, and that could become a problem. But if you take the entire thing and you fill the whole thing up with water, it makes sure that the temperature of the uh, entire pot doesn't go above 212 and the plastic can handle 212. 
Uh, but you can just fill them up like that, and then once your water is nice and hot, you, uh, you know, with, safely, <laughs> can uh, reach in with tongs or something. You can pick these guys up out of there. I guarantee you, if you're thinking, oh, well, the whole surface is going to be, you know, all, uh, all wet. Why would you want to, like, you know, put that in a sleeping bag with you? It's so hot, the thing dries off really quickly. It just uh, steams right off. Uh, and this can go in uh, a sleeping bag with you or under your blankets with you. Again, you want to put it, like, wrap it in a coat, wrap it in a towel or something like that. That slows down the heat release and it also makes it so you don't burn yourself. Two good things. Uh, but these are really, really great. I've, uh, I've used these. I've used these, which are made for what we're talking about. And I've used these, which are not made for what we're talking about. But these, by far, are the absolute best. Great for camping. And great if you have grid down situation and you can't warm yourself. Because it is difficult, a lot of times, in people's houses to build a fire. Again, this is made for having a fire in your house, but not everybody has a house like that. But a lot of people can build a fire outside, you know, a small controlled one. You can heat water up, and then you can bring it on into your house. So that is, uh, you know... One of the great ways of keeping yourself warm through the, uh, the nighttime uh, when temperatures can get their absolute coldest, you know, bring a hot, uh, you know, jug of hot water with you into your sleeping bag. Again, things that don't leak are best, and these are really great. Uh, and that's going to keep uh, yourself and your family warm throughout the night. Uh, the other thing we wanted to talk about, oh, and I'll just remind you again, you know, link down in the description below. I don't know if I can do two links. A link down in the description below if you want to uh, get that video about how to dress in layers and use summer clothes to keep yourself uh, totally warm because you can you can use summer clothes and you can stay totally warm in them even in cold temperatures if you know what you're doing. So let's uh, transition over to how to protect your house. Now again this is one of those teachable moments where you know people you know they made their beds and now they have to sleep in them. People made houses that didn't have very much insulation. They weren't prepared for you know crazy spikes in weather uh, you know you know incredible hot, incredible cold. People haven't uh, planned for that. So to some degree, you know, like I said, you made your bed, now you have to sleep in it. But that, that said, there are some things that you can do to protect your bed somewhat, uh, you know, if you do them, you know, mid-crisis. And we're going to talk about some of those. One of them, and the biggest problem with most people's homes, is the idea of water pipes rupturing. When water freezes, it turns into ice, as we all know, and ice expands. That's why icebergs float, is because when you have a volume of water and it freezes, uh, normally when things freeze, they condense. They get a little bit smaller. Ice uh, water is different. When it freezes, it actually gets a little bit bigger, which makes it less dense in water. That's why icebergs float instead of sink. Um, one, which is great. It's delightful that we can see beautiful icebergs. Maybe not if you're on the Titanic, but you know, ice floating on water is beautiful and delightful, and we can go ice skating on it. All these wonderful things. Uh, but if that ice is in your pipes, and your pipes are a certain size, and the water wants to freeze and expand, it's going to crack open your pipes, and then once it thaws, it's going to you know start gushing all over your house. You're going to have you know, water damage in your house. You're going to have busted pipes. A lot, a lot of things that you're going to have to work on. So one of the things that you can do to try to minimize that is to minimize how much water is in your pipes. Now, if you have access to a compressor, you can try to blow your pipes out. Uh, you know, go to the lowest point in your house. You want to uh, you can take a bucket like this, uh, open up a spigot down in the lowest point in your house, and try to drain as much of the pipes as you can into a bucket, or you know, have it just go down the drain if that's convenient to you. But try to drain as much of that water as you can. Now, that doesn't mean there's not going to be some elbow where the water is going to be persisting. But if you can uh, go from a situation where you have cracks all over your house and all the pipes because they were all full of water versus having a few select cracks in a few places because you just weren't able to uh, drain them, isn't that a better situation? It's going to be a lot less money if you can drain the majority of your pipes. Um, beyond that, if you have access to a compressor or something like that, you can blow water through your uh, water lines and that can really dry them out. That's how you winterize a house. If you didn't build a house like mine where it has lots of insulation and you can just walk away in the middle of the winter, that's what people do when they winterize their house is they blow uh, air through their water lines. But whatever you do, try to minimize how much water is in those lines. If you have water coming in from the street, turn off the pressure uh, from that water source. Uh, and that is going to allow you to just drain everything out as best you possibly can and minimize that. Now, uh, I say that because I know a lot of places are having issues with water supply. You know, the water pressure is, uh, you know, it's not reliable. There are places where there just isn't water coming through the, the, uh, the city uh, water lines. If you do have uh, reliable access to water, one way that you can try to keep your pipes from freezing is to slowly run water through your pipes. Uh, that is going to be kind of like a stream. You can go out in the woods, in the middle of winter everything's frozen, but the stream is still going. Uh, moving water, fresh water uh, that's coming out of like a uh, you know, a natural spring. It's a little bit warmer. Water coming from underground is going to be a little warmer because the uh, 
the ground is insulated from the outside air temperature. So if you are slowly kind of moving some water through your house, and it, it just has to be uh, like kind of like a, like a steady drip, maybe like a step up from a steady drip, just kind of going through your water lines, that is going to make it so that those water lines aren't going to freeze because you have a fresh supply of slightly warmer water coming from underground. Now that can create a problem on the, on the flip side because uh, as you have that water leaving your house, depending on how it's leaving your house, it could actually freeze up on the way out of your house. So you have to kind of know how the water is leaving your house. If it's leaving uh, out of your house in any way where it could potentially freeze on the way out, you got to be careful for that. A lot of houses don't really uh, take into account the idea of water freezing on the way out because it's, you know, your house is warm, the water coming out of your house is warm, there's always toilets flushing and that's warm water, uh, you know, and urine and everything else going and kind of cleaning out the lines. But if you have a slow drip, going on a really cold uh, night and it's just kind of slowly going through the water lines. Think of an icicle. You got slow drips coming off your roof. They get to kind of a cold point and it freezes. And then another drip comes and it freezes and the icicle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And most uh, outgoing water lines are probably about four inches or so. Uh, you know, it doesn't take that much ice to completely fill that thing up and then you got your house all plugged up. So the solution to that, if you are going to be slow dripping water through your system, is have it go out in big batches. So it's not going out in that slow kind of drip so that it can build up one droplet at a time freezing. And the way to do that is to fill something up. You know, you can have it fill up something like this and once the, uh, the pot gets full, you can dump it. You could do it on something large like a, like a kitchen garbage uh, container or something like that. Like a gar well, I've got one right here. You know, something like this, as long as it doesn't have holes at the bottom, you can use that as a way of, uh, uh, you know, filling something up. And once it fills, then you can do a controlled dump down. Uh, that, that is really easy during the day because people can pay attention to when the things have filled up. Now at night, it's a little bit different because it's, uh, you know, nighttime and people are sleeping. So you got to set an alarm for yourself. If you have some way of setting an alarm, uh, you know, with a, your, you know, your phone or a timer or anything like that, you know, set it for, you know, every hour or every two hours or whatever. If you've ever had a newborn, it's no, no big new thing to you, you know, uh, so, you know, set the timer, get yourself up. One thing that I had done uh, back in my living in a travel trailer days is that I did use a kitchen um, uh, basket for filling up with water. And uh, the way that I created an alarm, because I wanted to wake up when it was full, not, you know, arbitrarily when my alarm went off. I wanted to know when the thing was full. Uh, I took a cooler full of air and I just put it down inside of the trash container so that as the water came up, the jug or the cooler would float. And on the very top, what I did is I took a, uh, well, I, I used a ladle. I had, I happened to have at the time had a ladle with a flat uh, surface on it. I took the ladle and I balanced it right on the edge, something like this. I balanced it right on the edge so the water was slowly dripping in and the cooler would slowly go up and down below the ladle I put a bunch of pots and pans and lids and things like that and then when the cooler would get to the top because the thing had filled up it wakes you up. So <laughs> there's all different ways of kind of engineering a way of uh, having kind of an alarm. But the idea is you want to have the water kind of slowly coming in so that your pipes don't freeze in that respect and going out in a big gush so you don't slowly build up an icicle as you go through. So. I can't see this uh, cold snap lasting that much longer. I think that, you know, people are going to adapt to it. You know, people are going to get through it. It's going to cost a heck of a lot of money and damages uh, that people are going to have to do for the cleanup. But again, it's a teachable moment. What we're going through right now, we do not have to continue going through. We can build better houses. We can uh, prepare for things like this. I run a preparedness channel. I'm all about solving problems ahead of time instead of waiting for them to happen to think about them. So if we think about these things ahead of time, there are all sorts of things that we can do to make these situations less bad if they ever happen again. And, uh, you know, with changing weather patterns and the high degree of likelihood that people are contributing to that, uh, you know, we have the ability to bend a lot of this so that things like this can be pulled back in the future. So think about that. But in the meantime, just keep your family warm, keep your family safe, and try to do the best you can to keep your house from freezing with crazy inventions using trash. <laughs> That's it. Good luck, and thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com.
Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.